Thank you. Um, shall we? Okay. So this is the last part, uh, and I have been given the honor of uh, introducing a very good friend uh, and an incredible scholar, <laughs> John Binney from uh, Manchester University, Metropolitan University. John um, Binney is a reader in human geography and is the author of The Globalization of Sexuality, uh, co-author of The Sexual Citizen, Queer Politics and Beyond, and pleasure zones, bodies, cities, spaces. He's also co-editor of Cosmopolitan Urbanism, um, edited by Routledge, and spatial issues of environmental and planning, and political geography, and social and cultural geography. His research interests focus on the urban politics of sexuality. This is not working very well. Uh, okay. And his current research projects, both conducted with Christian Klesser, are concerned with transnational LGBTQ activism in Central and Eastern Europe and European queer film festivals as activism. So there is a, a range of uh, a wealth of research that John has been involved in and I have the immense pleasure of introducing him to you. And his uh, paper today is called Euroscepticism and the Gender and Sexual Politics of Neoliberalism. Thank you. Thank you, Carlo, and uh, thank you for that introduction, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, before I start, I'd like to warmly thank uh, the organisers for inviting me to uh, speak here, and the tremendous hospitality um, of all the organisers, um, particularly the uh, incredible uh, dinner, the feast last night, Roman feast last night, that I'll always cherish that memory. So. And uh, I'd just like to thank all the participants here for a very stimulating and very convivial event. So um, I really appreciate that. Um, um, this paper um, I'm going to present draws on and also um, extends upon um, material from a paper that I've published um, in the journal, uh, the International Journal of Politics, Culture and Society. So I'm going to read my paper, I apologise, and I don't have any PowerPoint, I apologise. Um, but I'm just going to read my paper, but I'm going to try and uh, perform it, so it is, will be entertaining. Um, so the, the ongoing economic and political crisis in Europe has seen the intensification of Euroscepticism in a wide range of geopolitical contexts, as we're all familiar with. In this paper, I therefore want to examine the relationships between Euroscepticism and the gender, class and sexual politics of neoliberalism. And I want to ground my discussion of these issues in contemporary Poland, where the growth of visibility of feminist and LGBTQ political struggles in the past decade has been met with illiberal and often violent nationalist, neo-populist opposition by political actors that commonly represent themselves as being resistant to the neoliberal economic and social policies of the European Union. I want to start the paper by briefly examining the relationship between, or say some brief words about the relationship between sexual politics and neoliberalism before going on to um, discuss the class, gender and sexual politics of neoliberalism in contemporary Poland. This discussion I then develop with reference to processes of Europeanization in relation to the gender and sexual politics um, neoliberalism in Poland. I then go on to talk about the, the, some of the spatial dimensions, the spatial politics of neoliberalism as it relates to the sexual politics of migration in the EU, before finally examining how debates about uh, the Polish context can inform discussions of the gender and sexual politics of Brexit in the United Kingdom. And hopefully that these thinking within and between these two contexts can also help um, uh, generate or support discussions of these issues and these relationships more broadly. Okay, so the past, the past decade, we witnessed uh, a decided growth, a marked growth in the critical interests in the relationship between sexual politics and, and neoliberalism. For instance, in her uh, pioneering work 
on the sexual politics of neoliberalism, Lisa Dugan has noted that the contemporary progressive campaigns for the rights of lesbians and gay men in the United States have often been framed in terms of the right to privacy and against interference from the state. While writers such as Brenda Kosman have criticised the way in which struggles for LGBT rights and sexual citizenship have become commodified and privatised, others perhaps have expressed a more ambivalent position about the relationship between gay and lesbian politics and neoliberalism. So, for instance, uh, Volker, Volker Woltersdorf has, has noted that, quote, the gay men and lesbians have often been depicted as the vanguard of neoliberal transformation. And he goes on to argue that gay men and lesbians have, um, um, yeah, uh, that, um, that, that, that he argues that these kind of stereotypes around gay and lesbian affluence uh, render invisible class differences and poverty within queer communities. So the quote, uh, Woltersdorf, uh, the political discourse draws the image of people getting straighter the poorer they are. So I would suggest that there are queer winners and queer losers of neoliberalism that neoliberalism isn't essentially homophilic. And it's important to recognize some of the complexities and ambivalences and contradictions produced through neoliberalism in different uh, geographical and uh, political contexts in Europe. So since 2004, we've seen a marked intensification of um, homophobia within political discourse in Poland in response to the increased visibility of lesbians and gay men associated with campaigns such as Let Them See Us by the main um, LGBT rights organisation, the Campaign Against Homophobia. We've also seen the electoral rise of the radical right populist parties such as Law and Justice, led by the Kaczynski twins, and this period witnessed the banning of equality marches in Warsaw in 2004 and 2005, and in Poznan in 2005, as well as far-right attacks on equality marches in a number of cities, including Krakow. So the liberal sexual politics advanced by law, the law and justice-led coalition government between 2005 and 2007 sparked uh, considerable uh, consternation and condem condemnation from the European Parliament with the passing of resolutions in 2006 and 2007 condemning homophobia um, within political uh, discourse in Poland. Agnieszka Graf has suggested that the articulation of socially conservative discourses around sexuality has been a means of resolving anxieties around national identity associated with accession to the European Union. But I would like to suggest is that the material and class dimensions of sexual politics in contemporary Poland um, remain largely or relatively under, understudied. So for instance, the Polish scholar Tomasz Sikora has suggested that, quote, there's no adequate cultural criticism of the remnants of class-based distinctions in our post-communist society or of the new forms of such distinctions, end quote. So in seeking to try and understand the sexual politics of neoliberal transition in Poland, it's important to, to build on existing work on gender and class politics of, on, of neoliberalism within the country. David Ost has argued that class identities did not emerge in post-socialist Poland because of the desire of former union leaders to disavow class politics because of the associations with um, communist repression, suggesting that because class politics was deliberately disavowed, this has had harmful consequences politically in terms of how anger at increasing social inequalities could find legitimate political expression. So the suppression of class politics, therefore, has meant that anger and conflict over economic inequalities have found other outlets in the blaming of others. 
So the radical right law and justice led governments of 2005 to 2007 represented itself as the opposition to neoliberalism. This government was associated with the promotion of a populist, nationalist, homophobic discourse. Opposition to, to, to neoliberalism therefore took on a xenophobic, nationalist, masculinist, homophobic form. Stuart Shields has argued that the growth of the radical right can be traced back to transformations in the Polish economy, with these populist parties blaming, taking, becoming the electoral home for those who see themselves as losing out in the transition and who deserted the post-communist left. So these, the neo-populist uh, radical right parties were successful in passing themselves off to serve the interests of those who were um, disadvantaged by the, the neoliberal policies of previous governments. So Shields and uh, Pankowski, Raphael Pankowski, have argued, though, that under closer scrutiny, it becomes clearer that these governing parties, when in power, actually pursued neoliberal policy, policies rather than countering them. So the gender politics of neoliberal transition in Poland have been extensively studied and a number of writers have argued that this process was marked by a reduction in the status and rights of women in Polish society. So despite playing an important role in the solidarity movement, particularly between 1985 and 1989, women activists became marginalised as links with the Catholic Church were strengthened. So Agnieszka Graf argues that the 1990s, the transition to a democratic system in Poland was framed in terms of a remasculization of national culture, allegedly feminized by state socialism." Unquote. However, Magdalena Grabowska suggests that the political losses of the post-1989 period became, quote, an impulse for vibrant and diverse feminist mobilizations. So when it comes to work on sexuality, specifically LGBTQ politics in Poland, there has been little work uh, explicitly exploring their relationships to class politics. Tomek, uh, Tomasz Sikora and Rafael Maika argue that much of the LGBT community shares with the larger society a certain soft conservatism combined with a nearly unconditional approval for capitalism which should come now as a surprise, considering the, tr the, the history of the relative uh, LGBT liberation in Poland, such as the emergence of an openly gay and lesbian press, only coincided with the onset of the neoliberally infected capitalism in 1989. And uh, Sikora and Maika also note that some LGBT leaders, such as Pavel Leszkowicz, um, have actively um, suggested that... Uh, uh, the capitalism and globalization is in fact uh, liberatory, has been liberatory for, um, and uh, again, I think that's again a particular kind of contentious, if you know Pavel, that's, that's a particularly kind of contentious argument he's making for an effect. So, um, the, so, so the, the, um, uh, Kisikora and Mike are critical of what they see as this kind of antipathy towards parts of the Polish left as well, towards LGBTQ politics. And I want to contrast their discussion of these kind of tensions um, with Don Kalb's examination of the relationship between class, neo-populism, globalisation and neoliberalism in Poland. So Kalb bases his discussion on the post-transition uh, material dispossession of Polish workers, focused on the experiences of one work activist from Wroclaw, who says the disenfranchisement led him to support the populist and socially conservative nationalist uh, law and justice party. So I think it's interesting that Kalb then go on to frame his discussion of, of dispossession, nationalism and populism through uh, and, and, and the, the narratives of, of this particular um, activist um, through the Warsaw um, LGBT equality march which is a very important symbolic target for the populist law and justice politician Lech Kaczynski. Um, and he banned it when he was uh, mayor of Warsaw. So Kalb uses the class lens to analyse the Equality March. 
and his participants, sorry, his respondents' participation in a nationalist counter demonstration against it, the so called uh, Parade of Normality, um, which was uh, in opposition to this, this uh, march. So Kalb argues that, quote, a clash of, a clash of class surrounds multi-culti events such as gay parades. And from the point of view of post-socialist industrial workers who had lost control over their factories and communities, had barely saved their skins and in the collapse of their industries and had been confined to a life of hard work and material stagnation in a hostile public environment that openly fetishized consumption, they appeared as rituals extolling the pleasure of a licentious, free choice consumerism." Unquote. So I want to kind of just think a little bit about this, this quote. So in this sense, these marches for um, LGBT equality, or more accurately at this time, what you'd think of it as lesbian gay equality, are framed as symbolic of neoliberal consumption. And the, so such participants in, in, in the march are represented as economically privileged, consumers as opposed to workers, which again, this is not entirely without justification given um, what I've just said about Pavel Leshkovitz and also the way that Sikora and Micah talk about the um, kind of enthusiasm um, and the kind of passive um, support for kind of this uh, soft support for uh, cap neoliberal capitalism in Poland amongst LGBT people. So this kind of framing of participants in equality marches consumers as distinct from dispossessed workers is, I think, also problematic because it renders invisibility, re renders invisible um, the notion of working class queer people who may also have suffered from material dispossession under translate and transition. It reproduces this notion that um, queer people are. Um, uh, uniquely or uh, more likely to be um, from a particular um, privileged uh, position in society. It also renders invisible the participation of queer workers in contemporary worker activism, um, which has been a feature um, in, uh, more recently uh, is, is a participation um, of trade unions and, and, and of, of queer activists within trade union uh, struggles within Poland. Um, and also the participation of queer activists within um, alternative, the anti-globalization movement in Poland. So I suggested that neoliberal economic and social policies can help create the conditions for the emergence of authoritarian populist politics since the mid-2000s. The populist politics of law and justice were overtly homophobic, and what well, are overtly homophobic, and homophobia was politicised in order to further their nationalist agenda. However, while successfully presenting themselves as, uh, as representing the parties, uh, sorry, representing themselves uh, as, uh, as being the parties for, for those who have lost in the transition process, um, law and justice themselves enacted uh, in neoliberal policies in power. And, Neoliberal reforms have led to social, greater and social and spatial polarization. Um, so, and, and wider social, economic, in, social inequalities um, have kind of displaced class anger into other forms of non-class anger around gender and sexuality. So, I want to now talk a little bit more explicitly about the link between neoliberalism and Europeanization and the EU in Polish sexual politics. Um, David Patanot and Philip Ayub have recently argued that LGBT rights have become closely allied to a certain idea of Europe based on, on human rights. Um, and, and I, I quote from them, and they state, connecting LGBT rights to the idea of Europe has become a recurrent theme in international politics such that rights become a contentious element of belonging in Europe and a rhetorical vehicle used by those offering an alternative cultural paradigm to the EU. At the same time, we need to note to pose the question about which type of LGBT rights and which, which kind of LGBT people most benefit from this association. 
The EU may appear to have been an important actor in promoting LGBT rights, though this is um, uh, subject to uh, contestation, this claim. Um, but if the EU is otherwise framed as an institution that is a neoliberal project that serves the interests of European elites, we need to be aware of the limitations of LGBT politics at the European scale that fail to address wider social and economic inequalities. So in this context, Carl Stitchin has suggested that the unstated political economic frameworks of claims for sexual citizenship at the European level need to be given greater attention in scholarship on European sexual politics. In the Polish context, the relationship between neoliberalism and EU has been imperative for understanding the broader political conflicts, context for conflicts around what Graf has termed the politicization of homophobia in Poland. Graf argues that the gender and sexual politics were central to debates and anxieties within Poland in the 2000s regarding EU membership and accession, suggesting at the time of EU accession in the mid-2000s, sexuality became symbolically important in narratives of Polish national identity and how it was be be becoming transformed and challenged by membership of the European Union. So Graf has noted during this period that um, homosexuality became closely linked to Europe in public discourse, and she refers to some of the, the, the banners in far-right counter-protesters against um, equality marches with their signs like Europa equals sodomy, Sodoma equal, Europe equals sodomy. However, I argue that the material and class basis of these issues and the Europeanization of politics in Poland needs to be um, addressed. So, so Stuart uh, Shields has argued that political rhetoric against this intensification of neoliberalism has become very associated with EU accession, was most vocal on the nationalist radical right. And again, th this was very much connected to um, the uh, EU, EU accession. So within Poland, there was a class geography as well of, U as, of Euroscepticism and of attitudes towards the European Union more broadly. So Marcia Galbraith has suggested there's a distinct social economic basis and a geography towards attitudes, attitudes towards Europe. She argues that there's an economically disadvantaged Poles who are more, um, sorry, economically advantaged Poles who are more highly educated who are more supportive of European um, uh, integration, um, but there's, 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 there's a distinct ur rural-urban split between those rural areas that are less inclined to support European Union membership compared to those in the bigger cities. And the Galbraith has suggested that poverty is a significant indicator of self-identity and one's attitudes towards other Poles and Europe. So whilst the EU may be embraced by many LGBT activists in Poland at the time of accession, there has since been some disenchantment with the EU and its ability to secure improvements in the condition, conditions of LGBTQ people within Poland. E EU anti-discrimination directives in the area of employment were incorporated into Polish law and in 2006, the European Parliament did pass a resolution on increasing, in, increasing racist and homophobic violence in Europe, um, specifically mentioning um, the particular banning of uh, equality marches in, in Poland. But Graf says these, uh, sees these resolutions as having potentially a harmful effect in that they play into the hands of the radical right by providing them with evidence of EU interference in Polish domestic morality. So despite the EU EP resolutions critiqued by Graf, Pankowski suggests rather that the EU has been rather restrained in response to the presence of radical right groups such as the League of Polish Families in the law and justice led government of 2005 to 2007. And in a sense, the reluctance of the EU to interfere would appear to run counter to some post-colonial inspired critiques of the EU enlargement process, which tend to frame it in terms of the imposition of EU human rights discourse as a form of a neoliberal disciplining 
of what are seen to be the less economically powerful accession states from Central and Eastern Europe. This reluctance to interfere could also be interpreted differently as the failure of the EU to match up to its own pretensions to be a protector of LGBT rights. In her discussion of the European Parliament resolution, Graf characterises LGBT activists in Poland as uncritical in their attitudes towards the EU and the adoption of the use of notions of universal human rights. But we also need to think about some of the um, more mundane effects or opportunities afforded by EU membership in terms of LGBT politics in Poland. So EU, EU membership offered Polish LGBTQ people the opportunity to, to migrate abroad. Whilst the, the developments of the Polish movement has been supported by EU-funded organisations such as ILGA Europe. But we also need to recognise the transnationalisation of labour markets and class identities within Poland and mass migration to other EU member states such as the UK. So focusing on the, the transnational geographies of, of class politics highlights the significance of the spatialisation of class formations in relation to the neoliberalization and Europeanization of LGBTQ politics. The geographer Alison Stenning argues that, quote, working classness is placed, it is performed and constructed within communities and in turn shapes the spaces of community, economy, politics, and much more. So therefore, there are dangers in discussing class geographies as sexualities, particularly with the notion that homophobia or homophilia is a property of specific classes and class spaces. So this becomes apparent when examining discourses around migration in relation to sexual politics in Poland. So for instance, in the paper that I co-authored with Christian Klesser in the Journal of Ethnic and Migration Studies, which concern the impact of migration on transnational activist networks connected to equality marches in um, several Polish cities. I argued, that, or we argued, that activist discourses on migration and homophobia often constructed homophobia within Poland and also external to Poland in highly spatialized and class terms. So neoliberal restructuring in Poland meant the lack of economic opportunities at home, while membership of the EU made it easier for people to migrate within Europe. So EU membership therefore helped to create the conditions for the radical right to prosper as it helped to engender the intensification of social economic inequalities. But it also enabled people to migrate abroad more easily. And this wave of migration had also significant consequences for the conduct of LGBTQ <laughs> activism within Poland. Some of the activists in our study suggested that return migration from countries such as the UK would transform Polish society. And what was significant, it wasn't so much the, uh, the, the focal points uh, of some of the activists was actually heterosexual Poles moving to the UK. The, the idea was, or, or the fantasy maybe, or the hope would be that this would sort of change the xenophobic, homophobic and anti-Semitic attitudes of so-called, um, or this should all be in inverted commas, uneducated rural Poles. Um, and the local, the non-local, the non-national here is, is associated with a progressive mentality. And the focus on so-called uneducated people from small villages in rural Poland could be seen by some as a domestication of an orientalist discourse, or what some uh, Bakic Haydn's termed um, nested orientalism. So Christian and I have argued that activist discourses around migration and LGBTQ politics in Poland often revolve around questions around uh, uh, education. So the language of education often goes hand in hand with notions of disciplining. The idea that traveling abroad will teach these uneducated people a lesson in how to live in a more diverse society. Um, as I noted earlier, class distinctions in Poland are often articulated through attitudes towards the EU 
And Jill of Charzak has argued that the internalization of Orientalist discourses has been centralized, central to how distinctions have been made between the so-called winners and losers of neoliberal transition. Uh, and and she, she kind of makes reference to this kind of spatialized distinction, which is very important in Polish politics between um, and in, ter kind of in terms of internalist, internalized Orientalism, this distinction between a metropolitan, liberal, cosmopolitan elite in large cities, which is termed Poland A, as opposed to Poland B, which is kind of more uh, less educated, poorer, provincial, um, um, and socially conservative parts of the country. And I've suggested so far that class distinctions are sometimes be used problematically uh, between those who are educated about LGBT issues and therefore marked as tolerant compared to the lower classes who were constructed as being uneducated about LGBT issues and therefore hostile towards LGBT people. And all they would need is an education and once they get that they would change their ideas. So attitudes towards the EU have a material underpinning and are underpinned by class geographies. And these in turn underpin understandings of the impact of international migration on sexual politics in Poland. And kind of finally in the last part of the paper, I want to, and this is kind of the more new bit, um, I want to discuss what can be learned from Poland and specifically what lessons um, can be applied um, in thinking about the gender and sexual politics of Brexit. So how, what we can learn from a decade of um, work um, on, on, on Poland by, by a number of writers talking about gender and sexual politics of neoliberalism. So in her essay on attacks on the so-called gender ideology in Poland, Elisabetta Korolczyk has argued that the scale and nature of similar attacks across a range of global political contexts demands a transnational and comparative perspective rather than seeing such attacks as uniquely or specifically local Central and Eastern European phenomenon. Therefore, after Korolczyk, we need to go beyond methodological nationalism and in this context theorise between Poland and the UK and see what we can learn about thinking about the gender and sexual politics of neoliberalisation and Europeanisation within and between these two contexts. So first, in, in, in terms of the representation of the UK by some Polish activists in our study, as a space of freedom, liberalism, respect for difference, we need to, to recognise the importance of spaces of hope and fantasy that, um, in terms of transforming Polish society, this, this fantasy that the transformation could happen in the, by the exposure to a greater range of differences in the UK. So we, when we wrote, originally wrote this article, Christian, I noted this was a highly problematic framing of the United Kingdom, particularly given the prevalence of xenophobic, racist attacks in the UK and ongoing homophobia. Indeed, the figure of the Polish migrants to the UK has become increasingly racialized in the rise of English nationalist and anti-immigrant political discourse in the lead up to the Brexit vote and attacks on Polish community centres and hate crimes against Polish and other migrants has been a feature of the poisonous post-Brexit period in the UK. Secondly, we need to challenge how class distinctions can become reified and fixed within geographical framings of, say, cosmopolitan Poland A versus Poland B, uh, socially conservative. Such a geographical imaginary to shape discussion of neoliberalization and Europeanization within Poland. But I, set, I suggest such a kind of uh, geo, um, politically, geographical imagination has very much sort of shaped um, debates around Brexit within the UK, where the UK has been reimagined, not in terms of, for instance, Labour versus Conservative voting areas, but in terms of areas uh, that voted Leave versus areas that voted Remain. And I think this is quite problematic in some of the discussions that have emerged around, around class, the class dimensions of Brexit that tend to kind of fix these class distinctions into place and then kind of 
leading to very simplistic uh, generalizations about certain parts of the country being more um, uh, Eurosceptic than others. And thirdly, Stuart Shields has shown in the Polish um, case that popularism, nationalism, and neoliberalism can coexist. So in this sense, the, the rhetoric of resistance to neoliberalism can be a powerful means of rationalizing further deepening of neoliberal politics. And in Brexit, the gender and sexual politics of Brexit remain regressibly somewhat invisible within the plethora of some of the initial academic and other responses to, to Brexit. There's a distinct lack of women's feminist and queer perspectives in emerging academic and wider debate. This is something which very much reflects the masculinist nature of the referendum campaign, during which Lewis wrote that women's voices are still underrepresented in the debate about the EU, and several of the other pieces that I read um, in relation to this issue talked about that. That was actually the main issue was discussed, was the lack of um, uh, women's voices and, and feminist voices in, in these debates. And also we witnessed the political assassination of Joe Cox, the Labour MP, um, by a far-right sympathiser, um, which, which for me powerfully symbolised the misogynistic silencing of women's voices during this um, referendum campaign. And I think it's also significant that that was not prosecuted as a terrorist crime, it's a far-right crime. Um, so in terms of L um, LGBT Q politics, whilst it's important to know that many LGBT people voted for Brexit and not just simply to equate cosmopolitanism with um, um, a kind of, you know, a sort of LGBTQ sort of standpoint, we need to recognise that many LGBT people are also voted for Brexit. The fear of the other has become more legitimate and acceptable in the wake of, of Brexit in political discourse. So, they in, in, including, um, so in, according to Gallup, the main organisation that monitors anti-LGBT hate crime, there's been a phenomenon emerging of per perpetrators explicitly linking Brexit to their anti-LGBT um, uh, abuse. So, other examples of explicit homophobic interventions include the attempted demonisation by the Daily Mail of one of the High Court judges who ruled that Article 50 must be voted on by the Parliament in the UK. And they were represented as being a so-called openly gay ex-Olympic fencer, as if that was a way of you know, delegitimizing them, uh, calling into question as well their loyalty towards the state and towards the country. So the rise in racist, xenophobic attacks in the post-Brexit period, the dehumanising use of millions of EU nationals as bargaining chips um, in Brexit negotiations with the EU would make one seriously put into question any remaining assumptions uh, or fantasies about the liberal, tolerant or progressive nature of the UK articulated by many Polish LGBTQ migrants to the UK within existing academic studies. Moreover, as Marta Titchener has argued, it's important that Westerners stop seeing the rise of authoritarian populist right-wing politicians as simply a characteristic of or feature specific to societies in Central and Eastern Europe, and that we learn from West, um, um, we, that, that those in Western contexts learn from um, the experiences and make connections with events um, um, elsewhere. And, and, and a quote from her, it should now be obvious that in the East and the West, we are all in the same boat. And I think that's quite a contentious statement because I, I, what I want to agree with her, and it's obviously it's a rhetorical statement, it obviously it's, <laughs> it's not the case that, that, that the experience of neoliberalism is the same everywhere equally and uh, if you can compare, for instance, living standards and how they're changing and imp unemployment levels, for instance, in the UK compared to um, Poland, it's rather different. Um, so, but, but she's keen to, to, to note that because the rise of neoliberalism, authoritarian populist responses to it, and the decline of the left occurred earlier in Central and Eastern Europe, 
the left in the UK and elsewhere should learn from the example of the left in Central and Eastern Europe. And what she argues is they should not form alliances with liberals because it makes them more complicit with neoliberal policies and makes them therefore more vulnerable to uh, attacks by the, by, the, by the right, by the far right. She argues that experience in the Central Eastern European context has shown that this is a suicidal tactic for the left, she claims, suggesting that instead the left must propose concrete and political suggestions rather than abstract ones to improve the lives of workers. Um, but at the same time, she notes that if we are to keep imagining that people vote for the right because this is how they are by nature, we will make the right unstoppable. So I'm not quite sure whether I exactly agree 100% with Titchener's uh, statement, because you have to have to build constituencies and build alliances around, around particular issues to affect change. So in the conclusion, what I've tried to do in this paper is um, argue that the context of contemporary Poland, the politicization of homophobia, has served to reproduce a class distinction between the winners and losers of neoliberal transition. Equally, I've argued that examining the Europeanization of sexual politics, it's important to recognize the multiple positions and relationships to the processes of Europeanization and their class politics. While focusing on the class, gender, and sexual politics and neoliberalization within contemporary Poland, the article, this, this paper has attempted to point towards the limitations about considering neoliberalism in one context, one geographical context, in one country. So we need to go beyond uh, kind of methodological nationalism. And I've suggested that uh, we need to think productively in terms of the transnational politics of class. So this paper's demonstrated the need to recognize the contingent and complex nature of the relationship between gender and sexual politics, neoliberalism, and the practices of Europeanization. Obviously, this is a politically imperative project given the intensification of social and spatial inequalities within the European Union engendered by the current economic crisis, which as Brexit demonstrates is producing new political scapegoats and outsiders. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, John. Uh, any questions from the floor? Yeah, yeah, you can sit and I'll, ch I'll chair the questions. The demand, demand. It's not comfortable. It's not like Bring the microphone. Oh, God. Oh, God. Is that all right? I don't know which how they work. Uh, do we have questions? Mm. One is here. Um, tre piccole questioni scusami per l'italiano ho tre piccole questioni la prima è um, se è possibile affrontare il tema per te del nesso tra mascolinità e politiche neoliberiste, crisi delle politiche neoliberiste in Europa, anche in termini più, se vuoi, trasversali, riconoscendo che ad esempio il conflitto tra elite tecnocratiche e richiami identitari nazionalistici siano interni a due, pol due polarità dei modelli di mascolinità, se vuoi, egemone, no? il riferimento al soggetto liberale, razionale, padrone di sé, responsabile di sé e richiamo invece al modello della mascolinità eh, diciamo comunitaria, identitaria che è legata a una genealogia patriarcale e quindi come questo conflitto possa essere inteso non come un conflitto tra eh, due, due identità differenti ma interne a due riferimenti della mascolinità, no? la mascolinità come riferimento alla razionalità del cittadino moderno, libero e neoliberale, responsabile e padrone di sé e l'altra diciamo invece al maschile tradizionale eh, 
difensore di, una, eh, di un riferimento identitario di, di nazionalità e di sangue. La seconda domanda è quanto pensi che possa essere potente il richiamo alla mascolinità come riferimento identitario di fronte alla crisi complessiva no? e quindi ai fenomeni di eh, perdita di riferimenti, di rottura dei legami sociali, rottura delle reti sociali, rottura dei nessi di senso nella lettura dei conflitti e della politica. L'ultima domanda è, tu hai fatto molto riferimento alla eh, omofobia nelle politiche diciamo, nazionalistiche, nelle politiche eh, anche di tipo di identitario. Ti chiederei quanto si è intrecciata ad esempio invece la difesa dei diritti delle persone omosessuali e delle... Ehm, condizioni diciamo, di relazioni di libertà e di riconoscimento tra differenze in Europa con politiche islamofobe o comunque come politiche, con politiche di ostilità verso culture rappresentate come ostili ai diritti omosessuali. Penso ovviamente all'uccisione del politico olandese che di questo tema dei diritti degli omosessuali ha fatto un elemento anche di campagna contro la pericolosità degli islamici ma penso a tante altre esperienze di questo tipo grazie posso anche dire domande giusto per dare più spazio posso sentire prego prego devo dire che nella relazione molto interessante e molto complessa non ho sempre perfettamente capito si intende, sì. Eh? E non ho sempre perfettamente capito il nesso che lei ha costruito, ad esempio, tra populismo, neoliberismo, adesione alla UE, strati sociali medio alti, eccetera. Eh, quindi chiedevo anche un chiarimento rispetto a una delle ultime affermazioni, nelle quali, ad esempio, ha parlato di perdenti e vincenti rispetto al neoliberismo e ha fatto un riferimento all'omofobia, non ho capito se i neoliberisti sono o meno, posso farne un'altra domanda brevissima? Eh, C'è un argomento molto più complicato che pongo soltanto rapidamente, lei ha fatto riferimento al discorso delle differenze tra l'est e ovest, parliamo dell'Europa, no? paesi ex comunisti o comunque dell'area dell'est e di quella invece che è stata l'altra parte dell'Europa. Io le chiedevo una cosa, non sono un particolare esperto di mondo dell'Est, un po' alcuni paesi. E, al di là delle politiche, che in qualche modo sono formate dalle istituzioni, dai partiti, dalle stabilis, quelle che si chiamano così, no, poi uno le può condividere o meno. L'opinione pubblica, lei ha fatto un riferimento A e B, che non ho capito benissimo, comunque è lo stesso, lo lasciamo perdere, uh, riguarda la Polonia, ma se parliamo anche di altri paesi, L'opinione pubblica di questi paesi ha atteggiamenti che, lo sappiamo, per quello che ho potuto vedere, è sufficiente guardare le indagini che vengono fatte in questi paesi sull'opinione pubblica. Ci sono indagini che trattano questi temi. Eh? E le chiedevo la, la posizione dell'opinione pubblica come, come si manifesta, anche ad esempio nel suo paese o anche in altri paesi, nel paese che lei ha studiato, su questi temi, non soltanto la, quella dell'accademia o dell'establishment, io ho una domanda veloce John, la variabile tempo i fenomeni di cui ci hai parlato si sono tutti verificati in un, arco, in un brevissimo arco di tempo non più di 35 anni fa le minoranze, le comunità le organizzazioni di cui ci parlavi erano soggette a potenti meccanismi di subordinazione su, e adesso improvvisamente li troviamo dall'altra parte della barricata, complici più o meno consapevoli di meccanismi molto più ampi. La domanda è quanto la, la, la improvvisa velocità di queste trasformazioni ha colto impreparata la comunità degli studiosi perché non ce ne siamo accorti prima
Okay, thank you uh, for those questions. I'll try to take them um, in the order in which I can develop un uh, meaningful answers to them. Um, um, yeah, the, the point that you made about public opinion, and, and obviously it's quite difficult when I try to make a point about, for instance, pointing out the fact that the UK is not um, a kind of a paradise for... <laughs> Um, certainly L LGBT rights um, uh, and obviously it's it's difficult because I, I, I'm, I'm, it's also maybe a question of audiences and, and a sense of readership and, and, and a sense when I, I, I've been the, the kind of the audiences for, for this I think there's such a problem in the UK um, particularly around younger people that you cannot talk about it's very difficult with my students to talk about LGBT rights and homophobia in the UK because it's there's almost a, a denial that it exists now. It's the part of this discourse that I think particularly uh, that David Cameron uh, reproduced um, around the idea that UK is the is the most um, advanced um, country in the world and is more advanced than many or most continental European countries. And, and if you which is, is very, very problematic and uh, very chauvinistic, and um, it reproduces this this idea that homophobia is only something that is experienced in uh, um, in Russia or Poland or Uganda. I mean, in terms of so, I was link linking back to some of the the the, uh, the ideas and arguments that uh, Carlo and uh, that Danny were talking about there. So I think it's just important in the UK. But the things, if you do look at those surveys, um, EU um, surveys of opinions and attitudes towards sec uh, sexual diversity. The UK is very much the, towards the top of those. But I always treat those with a lot of suspicion um, because I think it can reproduce uh, these very problematic distinctions between, say, the UK as being this uh, bastion of tolerance um, which we've seen after Brexit that is clearly not. Um, so that, that, that's what I, I, I sought to sort of challenge these kind of... Uh, it's, it's difficult because I, I, obviously there is... Um, I, I've got the privilege of saying that it, um, based in the UK and people say, well, okay, if it's... Go and live in Poland then, if you're... If you, you know, so um, it's, a, it's a difficult one. Um, Again, this, this relationship between the winners and losers um, of transition, um, as I say, it's often been represented in a, ge a geographical distinction between the more kind of urban, um, westernised uh, uh, parts of, of Poland, um, who are seen to be more again gained economically. That's how the discourse is uh, played out. Um, and versus Poland B, which is the more socially conservative, rural, seen as less educated, um, and, and more socially conservative, as I say. So these, these is, in terms of the electrical geography of Poland, this is where law and justice has gained its um, political m momentum. So I think that that, that, that is an um, important distinction. And that then for feeds into ideas about the EU, and the EU is seen to be um, sort of jeopardising or making worse the living conditions in, in so-called Poland B. Okay. Um, now, the time variable, again, the time, it, it, the, the prob I think the problem we are, I, I don't know, I, I certainly am struggling with and certainly struggle in writing this paper is just how to respond to the, the, the speed of political events and how to um, uh, respond to them in a, in a meaningful way and try to kind of um, make sense of them. Um, so in a sense, this paper or talking about this paper is a way of trying to make un sense of Brexit for me um, because it's something I, I'm really struggling with um, for, on lots of levels. <laughs> um, so I think it's it's always easy to see things in with, with hindsight. It's everything's obvious with, with, with hindsight. Why didn't we spot this? Um, but I also think that, that events, you know, 
certainly in terms of elections in Poland, it's quite volatile. And um, I was reading uh, one of the studies by Conor O'Dwyer about, um, written in the context of the previous government, the civil justice, uh, um, sorry, civic platform um, government, where he was suggesting that a lot of these um, nasty events in Poland were ultimately creating a stronger movement and, and within Poland, a stronger LGBT movement. And he also had the context there of uh, the election of uh, uh, tr trans politicians in Parliament. And you were able to kind of, you've got to cling on to a hopeful future. And then, and then you have this new government, this law and justice majority government. So suddenly things look very, very different. And I think it's also difficult for us as academics, the nature of academic production, to kind of respond to these things quickly. Um, and also, I say I haven't really so much worked on Poland more recently since going back to, to thinking about Poland. And again, it's having to try and immerse myself in the fact that the political situation and context is changing again. Um, so, yeah, I, I think we're all up against that issue of time. and. Um, how to address fast-changing events. Um, again, in terms of, again, I haven't really so approached this um, paper so much, although, although I was making links between gender, politics, and sexuality. I wasn't necessarily approaching this from a, ma from a kind of masculinities perspective. I know this conference mm. is a masculinities conference, but, 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 but it's not necessarily the approach that I've, um, necessarily so much familiar with and, and, and maybe it would certainly add something to, 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 to this perspective. Um, yeah, that's, that's, all I, that's all I can say um, on, on that one. Um, and I think it's also deepening and expansing a kind of a broader theoretical discussion about the links between neoliberalism and different kinds of masculinities. I think um, that would be useful. I just focus on a very, very specific way in which these issues are being discussed within, particularly debates within sexual politics, LGBTQ politics, which they have their own, to a certain extent, the parameters of these debates are quite specific within that field. Okay, now I will go for another round of okay. questions, if you have some prepared. But I'd like to maybe just comment, uh, yeah. there's something I want to, like to go back to what you were referring to as you know, challenging methodological nationalism. Yeah, 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 and I yeah. think it's such an important, you know, Audre Lorde was saying we should start the fight from the place where we are. Yeah. You know, we're <laughs> that, that's, that's the, the, the beginning. And, and I mean, um, challenging methodological nationalism as a British scholar in Brexit, yeah. you know, within the, the space. And I mean, he was saying like that the, the sexual politics of Brexit is only now emerging in relation to violence. So there is all, be, you know, there is a Gallup, which is an, yeah. a, ch a UK yeah. based charity talking about the fact that since Brexit, there's been 147% of uh, increase in homophobic attacks in, in, in England, across the UK. Uh, you know, so what are the, the, the links that, that we can start making, you, you know, for yeah. example, or, you know, you, you mentioned the assassination of a woman in office, you know, that, that's also something that has also been treated mediatically in very problematic ways, as, yeah. as you yeah. sort of hinted at. Yeah. Um, um, but, you know, within all of that, you know, which is a very obviously negative territory, um, you, you're also gesturing towards transnational connections. What is it that we can learn from what, what's been happening elsewhere? And I guess the question is, how do we activate these connections? You know, in you, you, your work, and I know, you know, you talk about solidarity across transnational borders. Um, what kind of vocabulary does that belong to? Mm. Do you know what? Yeah. yeah. So that, that's the kind of thing that I wanted to frame. And, um, but I would like to open up again. So more questions. Yeah. Hi, thank you very much. It has to do also with vocabulary because I noticed maybe I'm wrong but that uh, you were talking about equality marches, right? And at some stage you said pride marches. And uh, 
first, I wonder what's the relationship of both terminologies to neoliberalism, if they have a different relationship to neoliberalism, and that's why you're using both terms. And why am I asking this? Because I've been studying for quite a long time now Pride marches in Spain. Probably, you know, it's quite important how they call themselves as we have two different kinds of marches in major cities in Spain. We have the officialist Pride marches, which call themselves Pride marches, LGTB Pride marches. And then we have the critical ones who happen to be for sexual liberation, as in the 70s. And they have a very different stance towards politics, markets, yeah. businesses, yeah. etc. So it makes a difference how we call things. So I would like you could go a bit deeper into this. Thank you. Can I reply to that? Yes. Uh, can I reply to that one straight away, Begunya? Because that's just brilliant because that is a cue to really effectively, that was the purpose of the project that I did with Christian Klesser. Um, 2008 and 2009, we were precisely interested in the, the nature of these events in, in different Polish cities in terms of the politics of solidarity, mm -hmm. the politics of uh, organization. Um, that's exactly what we were interested in. We interviewed um, 35 activists in different marches in uh, Krakow, Poznan and Va Warsaw. And that's exactly what we're trying to understand. So um, the use of terminology is, does matter. It's difficult when I'm talking about how other people are talking about them or representing them. And it's the same issue when it comes to, to the terminologies of LGBTQ, and, and when you're then referring to how someone else has framed something. So. Um, and I call them LGBT equality marches because if I just said equality marches, because I never called LGBT equality marches, but at least that, that was a way, if I just said equality marches, it's not necessarily obvious that they are specifically, a lot of them are focused specifically on equality around LGBT rights. Um, now in terms of what you're saying specifically, um, the first event we studied was Krakow. In Krakow, uh, the march was originally called the March for Tolerance. So tolerance was very much, the, the label for that was the idea of, you know, we want to be tolerated, necessarily, not even accepted. So it, it, there, there's actually, you could argue there's something, a step change, it is more maybe confrontational, an assertive thing to say that, we, that we're holding an equality march as opposed to a tolerance march. Um, what we found is that in each of the cities that we studied, there were quite marked differences in terms of the nature of, of the marches. They were based around coalitions. Um, and for instance, the Krakow march didn't have, um, it, was, it was coalitions around kind of human rights and democracy um, with like uh, secular parties, um, a lot of strong feminists, a lot of straight people, a lot of, it was paradoxically presented, represented as a march for visibility often, but many gay people didn't go on the march and you had many like families with prams um, marching. Um, so it's a kind of quite strange form of visibility that's being produced there, um, that uh, they're being attacked, they're being demonized by the far right as being gay pride marches, very much so. And, and, but they're very much uh, represented in terms of the people on them try to talk about them in terms of building alliances. Um, and for instance, the march in, in, in Poznan is very, more, very strongly feminist in orientation and um, very different in quality from, for instance, the Warsaw March, which is perhaps closer to what might be thought of as being um, a, a mainstream gay male dominated pride march in in the uk so you're absolutely right to say that about around, around the, the the names and the labels 
it just gets difficult when you're trying to compress things together. So I apologize if I've kind of uh, done a violence in trying to kind of, you know, because I think these, these things are really, really are, 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 are fundamentally important. And I also think that it's not, again, going beyond the, 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 the methodological nationalism also means looking at the, the links between the transnational links um, between localities as well. Um, so I've done some research on, for instance, the use of city twinning in between the Netherlands, uh, small cities in the Netherlands and Poland a, a, as a platform for conducting LGBT politics and activism. So we don't just think about the capital cities, the big cities, we think about the kind of regional links and the, reg the, 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 the region shouldn't necessarily be seen as being parochial in a way that, for instance, that those discourses about Poland A versus Poland B is very, very problematic for that. And if you kind of buy into that and reproduce that, it's really problematic because you ignore some of the links. So, for instance, the, the original motivation and inspiration for the, the, the high-profile march in Krakow was uh, the festival in Cork in, in the Irish Republic which you wouldn't necessarily always no. think about as, as playing a, a major role. So we need to think about these issues in terms of transnational politics, not just at the level of big cities, but also in terms of how small a city. So we shouldn't see smaller cities as parochial, as in one of respondents I interviewed in Rotterdam said that it actually that in bigger cities can be more parochial in a way. And I certainly think that London, no, someone living in Manchester, that London feels very parochial to me. Well, thank you. Yeah. I think, yes, will you answer the questions? Yes. Yeah. I think we can, can go to the pubs. Yeah, we can go so to the pub and check with you from. Uh, no. <laughs> there's another very short, very, very few short. Time, yes. Of very few. Forse mi eh, me sbaglio, ma eh, credo che eh, sia una, una grande mobilizzazione de, su, eh, innanzitutto delle de donne pol polacche che hanno riuscito a, a, a sbandire una, una riforma elettorale dell'aborto. Allora, eh, questo ha cambiato la correlazione di forze, ha cambiato qualche cosa eh, sul soggetto che yeah, stavamo yeah. parlando? Sì, yeah, sì, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, I, I just, I, I, absolutely, I mean, obviously the paper that I'm talking about is to a certain extent about a different political period, but obviously it's, it's, I don't know, it's kind of yes or no because these things go in tandem, don't they? It's kind of hard to know how to frame them about which is the... whether to celebrate that fact um, of that um, tremendous activism and, and, the, and that extraordinary energy that's, that's, that's been produced through it and one has to cling on to that or whether one is just very depressed by the, the fact that such a law could be brought in the first place. And obviously you have to side on the hopeful side because there's no point in being here you have to be hopeful and you have to cling on to that I think in the same way in the UK where I talk about the the certain extent the kind of evacuation of feminist responses I think there is a you know there is a very much a certain I know it in my my students you know a real strong uh, growth in feminist consciousness now um, amongst amongst younger people that may be, you know, that this is just responding to this, this concept. So there's, yeah, this context as well. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. We can close.